H2O is open source. Uh, but it's all open source. It's all open source. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I don't work for them. Although I wrote the platform. But I left the company like a while ago now, like three years ago. Um, so I've been doing low level performance work for like 40 years. Um, HPC computing and device drivers and all kinds of shit. They're the core guts of the hotspot JVM compiler stuff and language implementations. I have a lot of really in-depth, low-level technology you know, work. Um, and a lot of stuff I do is very focused on performance. <clears throat> so H2O, um, it's machine learning at scale. Uh, it remains one of the fastest tools for doing ML. Um, it's been, when I left, it was maybe 10x faster than Spark for doing the same kinds of operations. And a hell of a lot easier to set up the cluster and somewhat more difficult to program as a developer, <clears throat> which was, I think, a mistake HTO did. Um, and I'll claim at least some responsibility for doing that because I found it easy to code to, but not everyone else did. Best of breed algorithms, these are bleeding edge state of the art, straight out of the Stanford math guys, like whatever was the latest and greatest. We did it with all the bells and whistles. Strong focus for data scientists, enterprise work, integrated with Scala, um, Python, R. You could go set on H2O cluster running Scala instead of running Spark, for instance. It's clustered computing. And this talk is about uh, um, clustered computing. So what can you do with H2O? Anything that you map from an A to a B. Um, big inputs, big outputs. It's not just reductions. Filters, translations, conversions, there's all kinds of, there's a hundred primitives plus everything you can do with combinations of primitives. And all the kinds of reductions you might want to do, including you know, medians and means and rolling cumulative uh, whatever kind of things, group by, sort, merge, join, sort of the whole gamut of what you do when you're doing data science is all sort of available. And it all runs sort of at the same kind of speeds. It's all typically memory bandwidth bound. So this is intended to be because Alexi right there said, hey, do this. And I was like, that's a Scala conference. And he said, no, they'll love it. I said, OK. <laughs> this is a low-level talk. This is a hacker systems engineering talk. This is not about Scala and functional programming. This is about memory bandwidth, right? Loads and stores and happens before in parallel and distributed and fork join. Right? This is about how to get performance at, at a, a, you know, memory, memory bandwidth speeds for everything you do, Fortran-like speeds, everything you do. So anything you want to do on a big 2D table, um, you can read and write it like it's a big 2D table um, and anything nearby. And you're guaranteed that it's basically going to run at memory bandwidth speed. So you take your data volume, divide it by your memory bandwidth of your cluster, and that's basically the speed you get out. You're almost always bound by memory bandwidth, not by anything else. The data gets compressed. That helps you get you more data per memory bandwidth. Your data is limited to things like numbers and times and strings and stuff like that, sort of a set of low-level primitives. Um, that's geared for tall, skinny data. So less than 1,000 columns, basically, it's instantaneous. 10,000 columns works pretty well. 100,000, some things work OK, and some things, their parallelization's done the wrong direction. But at the, at the, the table long ways, I've tested it at trillions. So I've done uh, uh, you know, 7 terabytes of, of network intrusion data and done a logistic regression in 90 seconds. Right? So, so unbelievably fast compared to what you can get elsewhere. Um, as I said, most simple Java just works. I'll show some more of that in a minute. It's a very clean MapReduce paradigm. It's not the Hadoop MapReduce. It's just a, sort of hypothetically clean. Um, everything that you do goes parallel and distributed uh, for you under the hood. Reads, writes, appends. Reads go the same speed as plain Java array load. So say reads, you, 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 it works like an array. You have a 2D array. I happen to will scale you out and distribute you. Um, and you will almost always be memory bandwidth limited. If you're doing something with neural nets, you can get CPU limited. You can do writes in parallel and distribute and scale out, but writes have to follow the, the JMM model and gets a little slower. So I'm going to take a look at how I lay the data out. This, should, this is an old talk, which Alexi wants because he does, but because it's kind of fun to look at how, how you, these things work. It's somewhat similar to what Spark does and then somewhat different in some key areas. So the, the common unit of work here is a vector, which is basically an array that happens to have more than 2 billion elements, like a Java array is limited to. So the length is a long. It can be trillions of elements, right? You can get and set random elements. And there's a missing value, because that's crucial in the data science world. And it's variable size you can append. And the append, by the way, does parallel and distributed as well. So it's not, 
You can uh, append in the middle if you like, that all works. So a vector then is a giant array. Um, you can conceptually think of it as containing Java doubles, but it's compressed, so it's often not actually containing doubles, but it has the same properties. The length can be way more than four billion elements, and if you walk the array linearly, you're gonna be guaranteed to get the full memory bandwidth speeds. Be like, you write Fortran or C code for performance, but you're writing Java code. It's actually split across the heap tall ways, this way, um, and it is in the Java heap, it's not off heap, but it'll be split, and so all the different JVMs will hold a chunk of the data, and we use the standard old school stock GC with good performance, because GC has a time that's dependent on the count of objects, and we have very few, very large objects. All the data is held in a small count of me megabyte to 10 meg sized chunks of arrays. As a consequence, the default old school GC can handle, I've done it with like uh, 500 gigabyte heaps and modest pause times, like reasonably, for full GCs, it's all pretty reasonable. But of course, you don't have one vector because you're doing data science, you have a bunch. And so there's some sort of R frame, um, it's a, or data frame, it's, a, it's got some header stuff that's cheap and tiny and can be replicated around. And it's, you know, it's a struct of arrays model versus an array of structs. Um, we build essentially a struct-like thing um, from a collection of columns. And you can manipulate and add columns and resort them and do them anything you want in any order because it's just a point of manipulation at the head. But if you're going to, you know, within here you can randomly access, but there's a guarantee that the data is aligned going this way across the columns so that when you're working with one row of data, it's all local to that machine and typically be local in the same caches as well, They'll all be cache local, local as well, so that operations within a single row, I think I even talk about that here, will, will be, uh, you know, as you expect it, sort of memory speeds to caching speeds. Within a vector, it's chunked which is broken up into uh, uh, between a thousand and a million elements, kind of varies on the compression ratio. Um, and it's set in byte arrays and held in the heap in that way. And that means getting data out has to call a function. It's not an array access. It's actually a function at and set. And that does the decompression and compression and, and going back in. Um, and the compression might add some overhead, but typically your memory bandwidth bound and you're drowning in extra x86 cycles to go do work. And so the decompression is basically entirely free. Um, like I said, it's aligned within, it one, uh, uh, within one machine. So you can talk about a row and talk to all the elements in the row like you're fiddling with uh, a struct. Um, and you can read and write anything in here. And you can read and write things that are nearby. And it'll all run at the same kinds of memory bandwidth speeds. So when you go do some work, it's usually you're going to grab a chunk and you're going to walk over it. And it's going to be, you know, the size of this chunk has to be big enough to cover the overheads to launch threads to do the, do the parallel computation and small enough to get fine grained parallelism out. And the code you write is actually MapReduce. I'll have examples coming up, but it's single threaded code. You don't do anything with distributed or don't anything with, uh, with, with locks or synchronization or anything like that. You don't hang with data placement. There's no data placement here. There's, there's no uh, questions about how many resource blocks, or whatever. It's all handled for you. So I said you, you do, uh, uh, you know, you, you walk one chunk. You write code to walk a chunk, but of course it's scaled out automatically behind your back. And everything runs in parallel until all the, the work is done, and H handles the internode communication that's necessary, and it handles the roll-ups and the joins and all that kind of stuff that happens. And FJ stands for fork join, that's the underlying technology, it's Doug Lee's fork join for doing the, the load balancing of the bits. So there's a taxonomy here, there's a data frame, which is a two-dimensional frame from, now it's very common in the data science community, or in the, in the dev community to talk about data frames. Within a data frame, there are vex, these are arrays, vertical columns, um, which are broken up into collections of chunks, which when you code to, you actually don't ever see. And a clunk ha chunk happens to be a collection of a thousand to a million elements, where an element's conceptually a Java double, but it's compressed, but also there's a lot of interpretation layers added, so you can have enumerations or factors um, that will behave like a factor, but under the hood, it'll turn into a small integer value that will then be compressed and folded in as you expect. And you can get a row of this as a common unit of things that you, you manipulate. Okay, <clears throat> so it's a MapReduce paradigm is the main workhorse. 
Um, and a map is a map from type A to type B, and your input is big, so maybe trillions of rows. Your output can be big or be small. So you can have a big output, and you can have a small output. Big outputs are going to stay big in the cluster. They're going to be distributed around the cluster because they're too big to fit in one node. That's the whole point. So a common case, you filter and you threw out 1% of your data, you kept 99%, it's still big. Reductions take two Bs and make one B, and this is where you get your, your vector roll-ups, your sums, and you know, you're going to compute mean, it's the sum of everything and divide, your standard deviations and your min, max, and your roll cumulative averages and whatever the hell you're going to do, that all happens in reductions. Um, the reductions are not timed like Hadoop's reductions. Uh, the maps and the reductions happen interleaved, and the reductions happen immediately as, so, as, soon as soon as two maps are done. We'll see an example here in a second on that. And as a consequence, reductions are typically like invisibly fast. They are, they're just disappear into the noise. Most of your time is spent doing maps because you have to actually touch the data. That's where all the time ends up going. So the, the basic coding style is you extend an instance of MR task, math reduce task, which is internally called Mr. Task. And you override map or reduce or neither or both or whatever. And you say, you know, dot data and go. And it does what it's going to do. And you get your results back in your original instance. So here's a layout of a cluster which has some data distributed. And I'm showing eight units. And I built it in a logarithmic tree, which eight doesn't neatly fit. Seven would and on purpose just to make it a little messy. And I've made some new guy. And I said, go. And what he does is he takes the task, and he, he knows he doesn't have all the data, so he goes to other elements of the cluster and hands the task off to them and said, hey, do the task on your pieces of data, and again and again. And it's a logarithmic fan out across the time. So the time to launch is depth of your cluster times the network hop which is generally inside of a good, well-run data center in the below milliseconds, in the microsecond range. And in fact, the actual time to launch for H2O on a nice cluster is in the microsecond range to launch a job. So it, it, you can have tiny tasks and, and millions of them. That's all good. Within a node, it begins to do the same kind of divide and conquer. You have a task, you have a lot of data. You start breaking the task up to do half and half of the data, and half and half and half and half until you get enough data that's big enough to worth actually starting to do something, and that's a chunk. And then the tasks go and run and compute the map call on a chunk of data. So the coding paradigm, I'll show you in a minute here, but you're basically writing code to run over a chunk, but you don't actually specify the bounds, the upper and lower bounds. So it looks like you're walking over a two-dimensional array. And then I'll pick the bounds for you under the hood according to where the data is and what the pieces are. When the tasks are done pair by pair, the reductions are called incrementally on the fly. Um, and at any time two tasks are done, the reduction happens immediately. You know, within the clock cycle afterwards, the reduction happens. And again and again until you have done all the reductions on a node. And it begins to do a network thing back up the food chain. And the reductions roll up until the end results back in your end instance. And for just a simple pass over a data um, that maybe some numbers of gigabytes on this kind of a cluster, you could expect this to be done in milliseconds because it doesn't take long to, to walk the in or out in any direction here. If you were terabytes, it's going to take longer because just the volume of data is bigger. So what's the code look like? So you make a, an instance of Mr. Task, and you overly, override map or reduce or neither or both. In this case, if I want to do sum of squares, the map says map from a double to a double squared, and this reduction is a sum. And if I want to do three sums of squares, I can have stateful objects for which I'm going to do individual sums, and the reduction is going to go across. So in this case, I, I, I'm, I'm summing three things. I'm doing all the, the you know, first pass of simple linear regression here. So it's, it's not the same kind of coding style that you get out of Spark. Um, and that was, like I said, sort of the, the, the downfall from the marketing point of view. The company's still in business and still selling stuff, so you know, you're welcome to go Download it, it's open source, go play with the stuff and make it go. Uh, it's hugely faster. Um, once you get to this point in coding and making things run, it's quick and easy. So the actual, um, the actual code you write includes the, you, you can write this style, but then I have to do a lot of work under the hood to get you to this style, but you can write this directly, and generally people do because there's another efficiency hack for doing the loop here. But this is just, here's the loop over the chunk. So this is for i equals 1 to the chunk length. Do the decompression by fetching from the at values, 
and then do the math. So it's identical math. I added the, the wrapper to go touch the data. If I had loop invariance, and people frequently do, they go above the for loop. And the maps, instead of passing the raw data in, is passing you the chunks. Um, and then this is going to hit your, your Fortran speeds every time. Um, here's a case of doing a filter where I'm just collecting a Boolean um, and then counting it because I was counting people under age males, males below 17, right? Whatever it's going to be. Here's the filter where I append people who pass my filter. And the append is distributed and scale out so I can have a billion people in the, in the map. And the output is however many sub-billions happen to pass the filter. Um, and it's also distributed around the cluster in the same place as everyone else. But this is all done, you know, same kind of speeds as before. In the end, I make a new filter, and I call do all, and I get, uh, get my, my answer back right there. So here's a histogram. Here's uh, an array. I want to accumulate count of cars by age. So somewhere in the world, I say I have some count of different kinds of cars and, and ages I'm looking at. And I'm going to go walk over people and grab every car and get their age and the car and do a plus plus. And there's a couple things to look here. Um, the plus plus is not synchronized. It's a plus plus. It's a Java plus plus. But this code is going to run on a private chunk of the data with a private array, because I said new, in the map call. Because I said new in a map call, it's, uh, it's private to this chunk. I, have to, I don't have to do any synchronization on it. It becomes single-threaded write access, um, so it's all cheap and easy to go get. But because I'm writing it once per chunk, I end up with however many million chunks I have, so I need a reduction on it. So we got you know, utilities to do pairwise uh, Daxby kind of adds things. Um, here's a slightly different example, going to count uniques. Um, I have some billion things I want to count uniques on, and some in the world I say I have a, have a hash set that's concurrently safe, so I can add to it. And then the reduction says I'm going to put one into the other using standard collections put all, and so I can just say new uniques and go compute all my visitors and count the size, and that'll give me you know, the set of uniques and the count of them. Um, one of the things to notice here, though, is that I put the new in the class constructor instead of in the map call. That means it's shared across all instances on a node. Um, and that means it's usually read-only. This case, I'm writing it, so it has to be concurrently safe because it will be written to in parallel, but only on one node. Every node has their own, so that's the reduction is necessary. So the code runs distributed. It runs, um, there, there's no management needed for doing I.O. and machine resources. You don't say new threads. You don't spawn anything. There's no locks. There's no system exit. There's no concept. There, well, the concept of global and static variables is a little different because a global static variable becomes a node local instead. Right? And then you can have different kinds of input and output state. Small state is typically, uh, uh, that's read-only, is typically put in the constructor. And you have some initial conditions you set up, and you just set them as variables in your constructor, and everyone gets a copy of it, and it's all good. Things that you're writing to that are global are going to be done with a reduction, because that means that everyone's writing, which really means that everyone's contributing, and how is the contribution done, that's a reduction step. So you have a, a reduce. And if you have big state, it's either read or written or both. And that's going to remain distributed. It doesn't come back to a single point where you can read the big value. The big value stays out there in the cluster somewhere. And then you run a step, and you run a step, and you run a step. And like I said, the steps are really fast, so you can get a lot done there. So code runs distributed in parallel, basically without effort. You write single-threaded Java code, and it does the right thing. Um, single-threaded coding style, there's no concurrency there. Really, actually, good, really excellent resource management. There's Essentially, no knobs needed for, G, uh, for GCs or CPUs or data placement. There's no hot blocks. There's no hot locks. Um, to launch an H2O cluster, you simply say java-jar, and you'll get a one node. But if you have 10 or 100, that comes up in seconds. And there's no other layout issues going on. You load the data, start doing map reduces, and you don't have to think about how things are set up in any other way. The code can get really complicated. And here's like an ugly one. Um, and what I'm really showing here is that in H2O, as of like five years ago, there, there were 250-odd there were classes doing different kinds of MapReduce. Some up here it says it's a Lloyd's pass for 
Mr. Task MapReduce. And this was written by a mathematician. Um, and sort of straight up, without any help from developer, he was a mathematician who was learning Java for the first time, this and did uh, Cox proportional hazards and a couple of other fun ones because it was easy to write the code. And then it just up and runs at, you know, at memory bandwidth speeds. Um, and that's sort of the core guts. I'll go one more round and I'm going to stop early for QA because I'm going to stop early to go to the panel moderation that comes up right promptly at five. So we're going to run to the next one. So I'll just take a, 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 a high level overview look at the block architecture. There's these parts and how they connect and I'll break the parts out. But there's a, a, a part down here that sort of connects the clusters together and talks about how clusters talk to each other and includes things like the notion of what a node is in a cluster. And the serializer, we have a really fun serializer. It's easily the fastest serializer I've ever seen. And I tested a number here, uh, including everyone who claims they were fast. And we were as fast or faster every time. Um, and you don't have to do any sort of setup to use it. It's really slick. Now, it's only going to go node to node to node. You can't put it to disk and back directly because it doesn't carry that much information. Uh, there is a front end for connection with a web server. There's a lot of ways to connect, including R and Python and a, and a browser-friendly interface and, and reading out a disk. There's some MapReduce and distributed fork join to run your algorithms. And there's a data store, which is a distributed key value store, which is another really fast piece that's kind of fun. So what's the, this block? This is, what is a node? There's a proxy internally. How do you serialize? There's a, a, a thing that does code generation to do serialization. There's fork join. There's an auto buffer, which is a reliable communication protocol for both TCP and UDP and or disk and or a couple other things. Uh, in particular, if I talk to S3 at full speeds, S3 decides it's having a DDoS attack because we're too fast at getting data and manipulating it. And so S3 starts to cut TCP channel connections because he thinks he's under a DDoS attack. And we have to unwind that. We have to seek to reopen, stall, wait, do, do Ethernet style, exponential back off till S3 like calms down, reopen the cluster, reseek to the offset, restart the unzip in the middle of getting cut off, or whatever the hell you have to do there. That all, auto buffer does that, right? It's a reliable remote procedure call for TCP and UDP. And I can, by the way, break most revs of Linux, make the Linux kernel think it's undergoing a DDoS attack because I'm too fast at setting up IO channels. Um, and so I had to handle that too. Ah. Um, the Weaver, this is like yet another Java serializer, really? Um, but I, I don't need, for instance, to know the schema in advance. So if you're writing some Java code and it's going to have to go over the wire to another cluster and it has objects and things and bits and bobbles in it, you don't have to do anything at all. You just use it. And I, you don't have to tell me anything about it and I'll like figure, oh, you're touching this thing. It has to go over the wire now. Then I have to serialize it. And how do I serialize it? I cogen on the first touch. I come up with a little two-byte ID that says, here's the type for this guy. I handshake around the cluster. Hey, guys, if you see this two-byte ID, this is the type of the thing. And we will use whatever compression makes sense for this thing. And we'll do all kinds of heavy compression on the, on the object, and especially in large arrays, which typically in the data science community are full of uninitialized and unused pieces of it. They just grow and shrink according to whatever happens. So you find a lot of it's all leading nulls, it's all trailing nulls, it's all small data in a long array, whatever the hell. There's a lot of fun compression you can do. And we end up being as fast as memory bandwidth to read the data from wherever, compress, and put it in a network buffer. And we go straight to the network buffers with NIO and ship it. And the other guy unwinds the exact same way. So it's a fun speed test if you want to go there. Um, as a programmer to using it, it's completely mindless. You like don't know unless you try hard. You can't tell that it's going on. What else? There, there's a key value store. It, it has the Java memory model and exact consistency and can cache in all circumstances. And a cache hitting git will happen in a few nanoseconds because that's the time of a hash table lookup. And streaming puts will go at network speed because if you're streaming puts, you're actually writing big data as fast as you can around the cluster and you're limited by the network. And supports transactional memory. The big data is stored in here, chunked and compressed. Um, one of the fun things then is the code that runs on a node typically looks at only the data on that node. But if you have edge cases, because you're writing a stencil calculation, then you walk off the edge and you need nearby data. Nearby data might be on another node. 
and then the key value store kicks in, brings it local, and caches it locally. And you know, there's, there's an efficiency game there that everyone sort of wins on. Uh, and then, by the way, the, the key value store is another, it's a key controlling component because as a programmer, if you're writing insides of H2O to go figure out how to make some algorithm do whatever the hell you want it to do, you typically use the DKV to talk node to node to node because it's exact and consistent and fast. So it becomes easy to use to, to write algorithms in. So it doesn't only do the data store, it does all kinds of stuff. So algorithms then, build up from having the data available locally and doing the distributed fork join, uh, and above that you build the MapReduce, and above that comes the, the algorithms that are built on that. And you know, the MapReduce is the workhorse. There are other distributed computational paradigms active in H2O and sort of straightforward to write, um, but most of the stuff's done with MapReduce. And then the machine learning algorithms are built mostly on top of MapReduce. And then there's a front end, which supports a, a REST and a JSON web server, and it's your API for external things using whatever you want to do with an API. Um, there's a syntax for doing expression evaluation that you can pass through a URL, so you can make a URL that says, go do math, and then get a REST result back that says, the math was done, and here's what I got. Um, first class functions can be passed through the URL to map over the big data. It's tightly integrated with R and Python, um, and Flow, which is our sort of web interface, that's sort of a browser interface, that's sort of conveniently easy to like do, I wanna say stupid data science, point and click data science. I can clicky, clicky, clicky to load a file that happens to be a terabyte in size, and I can clicky, clicky, clicky to inspect columns and get all roll-ups, and I can say clicky a button that says, build a gradient boosted machine model on this, and look at the AUC curves and stuff that comes out, and it's all, easy and it's limited to what you can do because it's a point and click interface, but on the other hand, as a first pass cut of what the hell is this data and what am I looking at, it's like really handy. Once you go past that, you like to script it and that's sort of easily done with Python and R. And I think that's, that's I'm out of time, so I'll take Q&A for like five minutes and then I'm gonna be late to the panel. So, just done, done with the talk. Yeah, so I think you talked about Um, likewise, like uh, the more functional So the map reduce takes a function that it's going to be mapped across things. Yeah. So the the syntactic help is not present, but the actual way you write the code, it's new map reduce, open curly, you know, public void map, and 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 then you write the map call. Which if you're just doing the guts of an inner loop, it's just like a lambda for first class lambdas. Yeah. The high level I'm thinking is you were writing Hadoop and Reduce, it seems like an easy thing to go But if you were more of a start guy, then I'm trying to figure out how would you have Right. So, so the, the Spark guys see it more like what Python would look like as an API. You got a REPL and you can go say, do a bulk operator one after another. Um, we, I left before we did that. That was sort of a thing to go do. I don't know what its status now, but I don't believe it's present. Um, you can use Python directly and have it work on a terabyte cluster behind your back at the speed of the cluster on the terabyte. Um, and it kind of gives you the same kind of feel, but it's a, different, it's a different mindset. If you're comfortable coding in Java and in Scala both, the jump here is pretty small. So what do you think H2O is doing like uh, Spark is not doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone asks this question. There's not time to do justice. I know exactly what it's doing. I'm, I'm keeping the, the memory footprint really, really small. I don't make a billion tiny objects for everything on the planet. And as a consequence, I don't suffer the costs of having a billion tiny objects. So the class I gave yesterday, the first session in the morning, I showed walking through a large data set where by default you make an, an object for every little thing you bring around. Getting rid of that allocation gives me a 5x speed up. So it's just sort of stupidly easily. Like I, I, I keep primitives as primitives, but keep them small if they're small. Like I said, it's compressed. 
yeah, okay, so you think floats and doubles don't compress, but a lot of stuff's not actually floats and doubles. It's things like age and it's sex of male or female and don't know and, and stuff like that. And those kind of things compress like all hell to gone, right? So there's bit vector, you know, bit set compression and there's running encoding and there's combinations of these and bias and offset encoding. There's a whole 20 odd compression strategies and they're pulled out chunk by chunk by chunk and the best compression fit is pulled out. And as a consequence, the data set shrinks and I don't do the overhead of making it a capital D double, capital long, and the combination is like I have a tenfold less size in memory to hold the same data. And that's also tenfold less GC time and tenfold less bandwidth when you have to go do the math. And that's the 10x speed up. So do you have any plans to do this in GPU? Um, that would be H2O. They have had a lot of work done to do deep learning on the GPU. So it's a really nice distributed scale out deep learning model that they've been applying to the GPU land to do distributed scale out GPU deep learning. Um, and I'm not, I, that was started after I left. So I don't know what that status is. I would go talk to H2O folks. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> Um, I could peel it out sort of straightforwardly. It's, um, there, there, you need much of this base layer to pull serializer off because there's a cluster management first that says I have a cluster. And then there's an agreement amongst the members of the cluster of what, how we're gonna serialize an object. So the first time you say take an object and, and do something with it, uh, what you don't see is somewhere under the hood, somebody said a dkv.get of the key for the object. So you had to put a key on an object, but that just happens. That get call did that first touch look and say, do I have a serializer for this? If I don't, I go come up with one and I get agreement around the cluster, this is how we do it, and, and that setup is what you want. And that's what makes the sort of the magic work. There, there's two things that come out of the serializer that, are, that you can't dodge. There's a first touch notion, which will test whether or not it can do something or not. And then there's uh, 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 what the hell am I doing has to be fig figured out as what it means to do serialization in the first place. So there's, there's agreement around the cluster and there's I touched it once, and I, at that time I touched it, I can decide I've got a serializer. I, I emit code for the serializer, right? I, I emit you a custom piece of Java or code to go run the serializer on an object that does unsafe to peek and poke its guts. And that's where the speed comes from in that sense. Ultimately, he just takes the bits in the object and runs it through the compression field by field by field and pukes it back out to a network byte buffer. All right. so. I have a lot of fun stuff I can talk about here, but I'm due at a panel now, so, so I'm gonna go bail. Right, thanks.